Sanitary, yeah, let's carry some sanitary as well. Down to the down to Polytechnic, so that does it, yeah. Um, I'll have play on that and then the ZX in water system coming around. And you have one programmable Sinclair calculator. Right. As, I, as I mentioned to you, before, well, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk before, you know how it's telepathic and I can look around the room and I can just point to somebody and say, like, you're in the Alistair. See, isn't that amazing? Yeah, I think it's a place all this time. Alistair, do you find out some of these confused experiences? Do you find out? Yeah. So Joanne, excuse an apple too. Did that have a wooden box or? <laughs> and how old were you? Fourteen. Actually, that's kind of quite something else. Okay. Did you get to pizza for me? Tell us what you found out. Um, this is the next thing is this experience is the big one. That was his first computer experience being turned down by IBM. I look at where IBM right now, you see? If they only really took you on, you know. No, they get the case. So you've got your own computer. Yeah. That's seriously geeky, isn't it? <laughs> so, as I said, the talk's not really about me. I'm going to find out stuff about you. But now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience. Because they're very similar to your own sort of thing. So, my class. I, I didn't, I wasn't born in England. That's that spot there. I wasn't born in England, born in Ireland. I grew up in a field where we didn't have things like electricity, electricity and stuff like that. Oh, and um, the first day I came to England, I went to school, and they had all these computer things. And I asked the teacher, what are these? What can you do with them? And the teacher said, oh, well, they're computers. You can program them and stuff. But you have to come here for a can lunch, because we don't really teach you how to do that. Hello. We don't really teach you how to do that in our math lesson. So I came in and spent every break and every lunch learning how to use these things. And 11 years old, this was like, wow, you'd switch it on and, oh, I've got a little thing. Yeah, you'd switch it on and you'd get that blinking <laughs> cursor. And it was like, wow, I could make it do whatever I wanted, really. And the only limit, really, was your imagination. And you could, you could do things like, could you make it talk to you and have conversations and, and all this. And it, this was a world at the time that things like Space 1999 and Blake 7, where computers spoke. And I just thought, 11 years old, well, I can make it do those kind of things. Meanwhile, all my friends were doing this kind of stuff. They were, they were happy playing games like Pac-Man and Track and Field, and they had Jet Set release and Manic Miners and things like that. So, but I, I like this. It was just something about that thing, like it was waiting for your command. It's like, okay, master, what would you like me to do? And they'd say, oh, talk to me, do something exciting. So, this was, this was doing exciting stuff. So, some of you will have experiences. Did you ever get things like this? And you, a listing, that's what we call them, and you'd sit for hours typing all in. Yeah, lots of people are nodding. And, and, you know, we all had similar experiences. You got to the bottom and you clicked run, and it said mistake, you get a BBC, or syntax error, or something like that. And then you had to go back through it all, and then you realised that maybe, I don't know, you put in a zero, or it should be an O, or, or, or something like that, and you correct it, and it still wouldn't work. And then you could, if it was out of a magazine, it would say, hey, don't worry, folks! We realised there was a mistake in last month's listing. Do you want to know how to fix it? Well, just buy next month's magazine, and it'll tell you how to fix it. So it could take you two or three months if you waited, but I was 11 years old and I was impatient, so I had to fix it myself. And that's how I learned that program. And this thing with this particular computer, this is the BBC Micro, it, there was nothing hidden from me. Everything was there. You could go in, you could find stuff out in the manual, the programming book. It told you all about all the different stuff, and there was things like, made sense, like called Fred and Sheila and things like that. Well, what are they? I want to get to know these people. And there was all things, well, it was just, it, it seemed like the kind of right kind of thing to know. And then you could do things like interface and connect them together in, you know, 20 years before I even knew about the internet. Oh, I'm missing something. So, oh, yeah, computer club. Hey, anybody here agrees with computer club?
club? Hey, a few people. What kind of computer club did you go to? Now, before you answer the question, you have to speak through this for a video of this. Tell us about the computer club that you had. Um, I can roughly remember Lemmings and lots of games, unfortunately. And actually, um, I think the closest we got to programming was um, programming logo um, and making what I now know as fractals, but back then they were just like pretty pictures. Yeah, that turtle thing. Yeah, the turtle, turn, yeah, the turtle, turn, turn, turn right. left, turn on the other right. left, and keep turning left. And, yeah. and after you've done two hours of that, you have a square on the screen. <laughs> it's just amazing, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Could you just find somebody else and pass the microphone? There's a lady there, and she's really hoping you don't pick on her. Who wants it? No, I don't ask. Just give it to somebody. Give it. Right, you're getting it. Did you go to a computer club? A user group? A society? Oh my goodness. You've not, you've not lived. Pass it to somebody else who looks like they may have been to a computer club. Or even somebody who looks like they may have been to Tell us about the computer club you went to. I haven't been to anywhere. I have so. Oh, she has such impoverished backgrounds. Surely, there's a whole world out there that, that you don't know about. Uh, have anybody here been to a computer club? Right, get the microphone over. PBS. The uh, the love movement. I'm sure most of you people remember it at some stage. That's, that was my first experience of finding other people like me. So your first experience of meeting other people? Since I've been to a bit. It was very much like anybody there. Realising that all these people are doing the same kind of thing to me. And, you know, so you went to a lot, which is a little bit easier to group. You get to meet other like minded people and you get to develop. Okay? Yes. So the yeah, point. Things, you can tell other people things, it's all kind of nice and. Okay. And, and, and what? I do not think it's a microphone away and we have to get everything to be safe. <laughs> but sir, it's okay. So you, you, you got to meet people. And this is one of the points I'm trying to make, which I'll get to in a moment, which is that when you meet up with other people like this today, you can actually go from this level up to that level in a very short space of time. Because you, and you, and you, you're the best net, you're the best resource that you have, other people. And well, it's all very well having books and magazines and the internet. If you're not actually sharing that and interacting with other people, you don't really move along that much. Sure, you can sit down, you can, you can get a program in a book, and you can start on page one and work your way all through to the end. But many, very few people do that, because you need to share it. We're social animals, and we need to interact. Now I'm not a scientist, that's just what I've discovered. But when I was 11, and I, the teachers couldn't teach me all this kind of stuff, I decided to go to a computer club. And in Preston, where I live, there was a computer club that was called PACE, Preston Atari Computer Enthusiasts. I used to laugh because I grew up in my Sinclair spectrum and they all had Ataris and of course to an Atari enthusiast the Atari was the only computer that was worth considering. This, this, this Sinclair Rectum they used to laugh at. Oh, you know, Max was saying that as an X81. Well Max they didn't laugh at you after the room. You know, if you brought in as an X81 because they had all these American because computers were all about to be American and all this kind of stuff. And they used to laugh at me. But when I came home and I told my mum when I was 11, oh, uh, mum, this computer club's great because I've been talking to um, Bill and I've also been sp speaking to, who else was there? Roland and there was Russell. And she said, your friends have got very unusual names. How old are they? I said, well, I think, I think Roland's probably about 50 or 60. He's got a beard. <laughs> and she said, tell us some more about some of these friends. I said, well, I'd probably take a few cans of the because because maybe they need to wash a bit more. And some of them wear sandals, and when I've got a beard, my mum started panicking. She thinks, there's her 11 year old fraternising with 15, 16 year old men on a Monday evening in this such a labour club in Preston. So she came along to watch, and it was my turn to do a talk about what I was doing with my Sinclair Spectrum, and I was doing a robotics project with it. And she, and she thought this was great, but there's no other kids there. So that's a bit about my past. Now, my current job. I'm a teacher at a school in Preston. It's called Our Ladies Catholic High School. And lots of stuff happens at the school. And um, 
lots, lots of things have happened to me. So one of them was, well, let me just give you that for a minute. Now, there's a couple of people I've met before, so forgive me telling you this story again. But we have parents evenings, and you know what happens with parents evenings? You go along, or you, if you're sensible, actually, you hide. And your parents go along, and they find out how you're doing these subjects. And here I am, sat in parents evening. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. I'll just call them Smith for a moment. So Mr. and Mrs. Smith come along, and hello, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, yeah, good to see you. And they want to know about Jonathan's grades, and Jonathan's in year eight, that means he's 12 years old. And I say, um, but Jonathan's doing really well, and some of the recent tests, he got the highest marks in the class, and he's, he's got an A for this. And then there's a pause, and Mum doesn't look that happy. And I say a few more nice things about Jonathan, and, and still Mum doesn't look that happy. And she says, has Jonathan told you what he's been doing recently? And I said, no, he hasn't. She says, he hasn't told you about uh, PayPal and credit cards and all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh my goodness, what's he been doing? And she said, did he tell you that last year, she pulled a piece of paper out of her hand like, last year he earned 13,000 pounds. No, no, he didn't tell you that. And the year before that, he earned 11,000 pounds. And what he's done is, we live on a farm, Jonathan hates animals, he's got young brothers and sisters, they love animals, they want to be vets and farmers and stuff. But Jonathan hates animals, he says cows stink and he doesn't like milk. So he spends all his time in the bedroom teaching himself PHP. And he's created this site where people can go online, they buy bronze, silver, platinum uh, memberships and they pay him 30 pound a month or 50 pound a month. And it's this gaming community thing. And I just, we don't really think he's getting a lot out of his ICT lessons. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first thing. And then the second thing they said is, so how are you going to help Jonathan? Now at this point I didn't really know anything apart from BBC Basic and how to program my sync there and that kind of thing. So picture you, so you're sat there in that position and Jonathan's parents have just told you they feel he's not getting up from his ICT lessons. What would you say? There is another one. Chat to the people around you. If the people you spoke to before weren't that nice, look the other direction and talk to the other people on your left. What would you say to Jonathan's parents? Two minutes. So you're saying computing should be in the curriculum? That's a curriculum based rather than teaching computer capability. So, so, yeah. so because Jonathan's got these needs, change what everybody is learning in the classroom. That's one solution. Certainly tailor it to people's interests and skills, yeah. Okay, so make it more specific to, the, to, to Jonathan and make it more specific to other people in the classroom. Great, yeah, that's something I've actually started doing. And we can pass the microphone to somebody else who has another solution. We're of the opinion that Jonathan should be teaching about Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, that, that, I love that idea because that, that means I can sit down and do my crosswords while Jonathan stands there in front and it makes life easier for me. However, Jonathan is incredibly, incredibly shy and he didn't want anybody else to know he was doing these kind of things. And now he's just left our school, he's just waiting for his GCSE results next week. But even now, if I said, 
come in, come to this conference, Jonathan. He's actually come to some of the geek things in Preston, but he's incredible. He just sits there all evening, doesn't want to talk to people. But it's a great idea. And somebody else had an idea as well. You need to get him a business mentor. He needs <laughs> business studies, and he needs um, Excel, perhaps, so that he can manage his books. But if you're only teaching him Microsoft Office in the ICD lessons, Jonathan needs to be somewhere else doing something more useful. Yeah, he was getting totally bored if I wasn't learning, and and a bit nervous was teaching him things like PowerPoints because. Every 15-year-old needs to know how to use PowerPoint because you never know when you might need it. And, and it's not that easy to learn how to use PowerPoint, <laughs> is it? And in fact, it's so difficult that Microsoft have put in this whole help system to teach you how to use it. And it's not even very good either, the help system. So you have to spend a lot of time teaching children. I've been doing that quite happily for 17, 18 years, teaching children things like PowerPoint and Excel and, and Access and all this, because it's an essential skill that children need to be able to survive in our current economy. You're shaking your head. Okay. There's uh, quite a lot of them. Only probably about 99.4% knew how to use it before. Okay. What else should, Jonathan, should I do for Jonathan? I think you also you also need to learn other languages, other things that we need to do. Because fit through spine is also a question. It's all kind of kind of mindset to give you that ability. But I don't know, I don't want to offend you, but I don't know if you're the guy that's to show the teaching that stuff. Or show you that stuff. Find it, I, it, that can help you find more interesting languages, more, um, okay. you know, because there's lots of crazy frameworks. So, and there's also frameworks for PHP which do a lot of great work for you. So you can get on with thinking about what your business is doing or what your product's doing. And he's probably just sat there banging together himself. Well, very, very eloquently, you've put your finger right on it. At that point, I start to think, I'm not the guy to help Jonathan. I'm, I've not done anything since about 1985, 1986. BBC Basic, I've done nothing since. Did you, were you itching to add something? No. no. Oh, maybe. <laughs> You should uh, learn a C language, a true language. A C language? Yeah, sir! So it's a good joke between that and a plain language. Oh, we've got more people, come on! Let's hear the people speak, yes. So, this is going to be the overheard. Um, so, uh, I'd suggest that Jonathan's okay. He's actually um, learning stuff. It's useful to him. It's all in the He's actually he's, he's coping pretty well. You know, at 12 years old, he's earning 15,000 pounds a year. That's that's not bad. Well, I mean, there's a, we have a kids in the class who they never even thought about uh, putting that into. And, uh, and if he goes to university, he probably can cover his first year tuition fees as well. That's what he shows to do. Uh, he should just um, drop out because he's so confused. Drop out of school? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. That's why everything he needs. Yeah, he's not getting anything from me, is he, in my classroom? But even if I teach him, you know, things in scratch, he's going to be running like, oh, I'm still beyond this. Why is he teaching me how to do this? Yeah. I'm holding back. That's what I, that was what started troubling me. Uh, I would like to see him set up a computer club. Encourage him to set them up. Brilliant. Yeah. So this is this, these are all the kind of dilemmas I've faced. Now, one of the things I want to do is I want to put in touch with a mentor. So I said, Jonathan, and of course that's not his name. Jonathan, just print something out so I can take it along to meet my the geeks and press them. I can say, hey, look, one of my 12 year olds is on this, what do you think? So I brought it along to the geek up uh, meeting in Preston. And Jeremy was there. Jeremy. And Jeremy knows a little bit a couple of things about PHP. And he looked down at me and he went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I showed it to Tim, Tim Hastings, and Tim Hastings and looked through it and he went, ooh. And I said, what? He said, dear. He said, look at that. Ooh, there's, a, there's an SQL injection vulnerability there. I'm, oh yeah. <laughs> What's that? So he explained to me what it is and how, you know, basically you can get in there and start messing about and do something. But he said he's 12 years old. So he needs a mentor, really. He needs somebody to coach him and talk him along. So I went back to Jonathan and said, Showed it to some of my friends, and uh, by the way, got an SQL uh, engine, uh, one of them things in there. And he went, Yeah. I said, What do you know about it? 
Yeah, of course I did. Well, why did you leave it in? Well, because I didn't know who you were going to show it to. And I wanted to know, do they know what they're talking about? <laughs> So you're going to credit this guy, okay? So, I mean, no matter what his GCSE results are next week, his, his future is fairly secure. Maybe in politics, if nothing else. <laughs> now, part of the problem that was going on with me, okay, let me speak things up a little bit, was I decided, right, I'm going to start putting programming and computing into the curriculum. I'm going to follow the advice that came from somebody over there to change the curriculum. So he's moved. <laughs> so, one of the problems we've got is these stereotypes. So people think that, you know, because you're a geek, you, 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 you walk like this, and you wear t-shirts, and... Uh, they're not wrong, okay. Because they're either stereotypes, and we all... It, it's, it's, it's as a civilization, we pigeonhole people, don't we? We fit people into brackets. And, oh look, you see microcomputer there on the back shelf. But that's one of the problems we've got, kind of overcome these stereotypes. And the other problem, for me as a teacher, and I've been teaching things like PowerPoint for 17 or 18 years, I think, mean, right, I've got to learn this computing stuff. I want to get it into the curriculum, get a book. So I go to W.A. Smith's and look for a computing book. And wow, what a selection! Let me just zoom in on some of these. Oh, yeah, computer section. Well, I can use words, I can do Photoshop. Laptop basics, yeah, I think I'm okay with that. Office for the over 50s, I'm not quite there yet. Uh, power, so, that's not really computing, is it? So, the problem is, the, 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 when we use words like computer, this, this sort of culture, it, we're maybe not always talking about the same kind of thing. So, this is the kind of stuff I've been doing. So, I decided to just basically take the risk, go out, and start doing stuff. So, I was reading stuff, I was following what was going on in America. And then we started changing our curriculum. So about four years ago, we started teaching children how to program in school. Or not how to program, but what computing is. And we were trying to make it more the curriculum go in that direction. So these are 11 year old children. It's a mixed class, boys and girls. And they're building games using Scratch. Has everybody here heard of Scratch? Yes. Yeah? Who hasn't? Okay, you need to find out about it. It's great. Um, as an example, I don't get sponsored by PC Pro Magazine, but in this month's PC Pro Magazine there's a, a bit about how to create a game using Scratch. And I've got, on my YouTube channel, I've got lots of videos of me teaching people how to use Scratch and maybe I can I don't know how to do a demo. But, the, um, oh, also, I'm teaching children some Python, here's a programming language. But it's, it's an experience, just for them to try it and see what it likes. So this is, this is an 11 year old made a game here. Um, Robbie, do you know what's happening in this game? Okay, so just give, give Robbie a bit of time to catch up with the rest of this. Robbie's just said to his interpreter, you have to guess the random number. It's a random number game. Yeah. Yeah. So it chooses a random number, but presents it as a nasty character, and you have to guess. Or it, or it does it do the way around or something like that. So these are the kind of things that 11 year olds now are doing in our school. These are the youngest children I teach in our school. So that's how the curriculum has changed. I've also been going out because, yes, you're right. You said I'm not the person for Jonathan. So I need to go out and find out, well, who, is, who are these mentors? So I've started going to things like bar camps and doing talks as well. And, and yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so I did this talk about a project that didn't exist, made up this idea, had this vision, it was called Cold Lab and the BBC were doing And that actually worked out quite well, because stuff's happening now. Um, also, I started doing events, and events for parents would come along as well, families, and hobbyists, and developers, and computer scientists. So, so we now, in our holidays, our school doesn't close now, we keep it open and we run events, and that one is like a, a child's made of badge. Use it to these things, hammer beads. Great fun. Because if you get a power cut, you've always got hammer beads. So, um, building little characters and stuff. Um, Julian Skidmore, the guy who conceived and developed this enlightened computer that you, that you solder it, assemble it, program it yourself, he came to our school and did a workshop. So, we had children there assembling and building computers. That was a workshop we did one day. I've blogged all about this, I've got videos online. Oh, this was amazing. Right, on a Friday evening, the night before Kite Box. Now, nobody got killed or 
But 50 people came into our school on a Friday evening from 6 o'clock till about 10 o'clock, half past five, is that all okay? And we had loads of people, and it was like a dojo. I've been to this dojo in Preston, you know, you go along and you practice your martial arts and your programming skills at the same time. And I thought, hey, let's do one of them in school. So I've been going out and taking ideas and kind of doing the school. So we've got things like, hey, we've got the girl who was, she was 11 years old. Uh, she got paired up with one of my GCSE computing students, and she brought her grandparents along. So they were one of the teams, so we've got all these teams of uh, children and teachers, and um, they're actually, they got roped in, and I used to rope in, I rope people, they just said, but they're my next door neighbours, they came along as well. So it's not just people who go to our school, it's anybody who wants to know about this kind of stuff, or they want prizes. And then we had another event where the BBC made a film about it. So I'm going to shut up and play that film for a few minutes. So this event was called Pack the Future. So, okay, so my laptop's decided it's, it's, it, it's got other plans. Oh, that's okay. Okay, so. Isn't that just so comfortable? Let me get that little spinning ring on oh, this. Yeah, that's the problem. I, I, there's a curse in me. You bring a Windows laptop to an open source conference and you just know things are going to go wrong. <laughs> ah! Sound. Is there a way I can get sound from my laptop to the jack? I should have asked about this before. <laughs> yes. I can stand on this, couldn't I? So, uh, what are this guy doing now? Look back at that. So I try this. Yeah? I knew that was there all along. I just didn't want you fall asleep. You know? So let's see. And I knew you should have before. Oh, I'm going to stand up. I don't have any Jonathan here to show me how to use my laptop. So, we've no sound at the moment. Just like the experience, like doing all this stuff, it's like, what's the life like that? Welcome to Hack the Future. Hack the Future is about putting the digital creators of today, people like software developers, computer scientists, with the digital creators of tomorrow. So we've got teachers coming along, and I'm hoping that some of the teachers will feel inspired. I've also got parents coming along, and a lot of these parents think, wow, that's great. I wish, when I was at school, we did, the, we did these sorts of things. I've got people from industry, so there are, there are software developers here, some of them work for Microsoft, Google, the BBC, large organisations. And it's about getting all these people together in one space and seeing what can come out of it. We've got a room packed, packed with kids who wanted to do something. We've got all their parents there. So kids and parents come into this place because they know it's important and there's a huge buzz around it. We have an exciting day planned for you and there are 135 adults who have come here. About 80 of them are all really, really passionate and excited about something. You can be one of those people who support cancer research. You can be one of those people who design robots that build cars. You can send people into space. You can send robots to Mars. All these amazing things are just waiting for you. If you really so far were great. The sessions were absolutely fascinating. And just seeing the kids getting really excited about something that they've probably experienced as really boring in school. The most terrible thing that I've done today is building a camera in a workshop and learning how to make it on the computer and then build it as well. So today we're showing .NET Engineer, which is a rapid prototype like a platform for creating electronic uh, gadgets, effectively. So each session we're building a digital camera. This is a problem case that we have that's been laser cut. And using the components from the gadget here platform here, we can we can add them to this case in order to create a digital camera. The event today has been really amazing. Every session we've had has been absolutely packed out in here and uh, we've really enjoyed ourselves today. It's been really good fun. These are non-transitive guys, so we take a look at the different colours there. They've got a, a different uh, number set on them. 
the idea is that they work a bit like rock, paper, scissors, and they have uh, one that they're weak against uh, and one that they're weak against. So, let's talk about Fender Code, which is a website where it makes making games easy. Who here has done programming of any kind before? What do you want to do? Is he able to change it? Well, I have the idea. What if Jonathan, when he was 11 years old, when he first came to our school, if he'd met people who were like software developers and computer scientists, rather than him now at the age of 16, he's kind of set in his own ways now. I mean, he thinks that PHP is the best programming language in the world. But he, he didn't have a chance to discover some of the alternatives, and I wasn't the person to show him. So the idea was to hack the future, would you take today's developers? And you pair them up with tomorrow's developers and computer scientists. But not in like a matchmaking way, like, hey, 11 year old girl, meet this 40 year old man, you're going to be very happy together. <laughs> that wasn't my plan. It was just sort of to be inspired. And it works, because at the end of the day, people were telling me, oh, I was on the bus, leaving the school. It was a freezing cold Saturday morning in February. It would be so easy to stay in bed. But there was kids on the bus apparently saying, Forget what I said I wanted to do. I want to do that, that, what that guy was doing, what that girl was talking about, you know, putting people on the moon using computers. And, and that was the idea. It was supposed to inspire people. And, and it's, and it, you know, still keep hearing stories, people come back and saying, you know, that really, really helped. So I'm trying to take that idea and build on it a little bit more. So here, here's where we're up to now. So a few weeks later, we then organise another one. It's Pax the Future, basically, on camp for everybody. It's for families. And no matter how old you are, so anybody can come. It, it, well, it's anybody who wants to come can come. We don't force people into it. So we have one at, we have one at Media City, you know, the following month. And these people here came. We had a session called Meet the Geek. It's like speed dating. But again, I'm not going to pair up 40 year old because, you know, okay. And I've already done that to you. Uh, so these people, these work for a company called Double Negative. And they make all the visual effects of films like Harry Potter, Total Recall. So they came up from London for the day to meet our kids to try and inspire them. And see that sword? That's Malfoy's sword from Harry Potter. So they actually brought props. And the kids were like, whoa, got to meet these people. You know, they, they never even heard of the visual effects industry until they met them. Um, this is, she's called Claire, she's a games developer for BBC, uh, Children's BBC. And look, interaction, she said, hey, look at what I do, this is my job. And I'm trying to put in there role models, positive role models, especially of females working within this industry with digital creation. And this is a guy who used to work for Sony Computer Entertainment Europe, and he's explaining all about designing and developing games. It's not all about games. This, is a, this was a parent of another school Michelle, tweeting Michelle on, on Twitter. And the school that her kids go to, she noticed that when visitors came in, you had to sign this book, and then you had to do this, and you had to get a Why not create an app? And she'd never made an app in her life, but she thought, I've got an iPad. She left. So she made an app. You know, look at her. She's not a computer scientist, she's not a developer, she just went out and did it. And she hopefully inspired these kids. And they were saying, gosh, she was like somebody's mum. Well, yeah, what's wrong with that? So, that's kind of what's going on in school, that's what's going on outside of school. Now, question for you. 
Who are your computing heroes? Who do you think the people at the moment that if, if, if somebody was coming to talk today that you'd want to come and find out or, or you see as being an inspiration? And we need the microphone. So let's find out who some of your heroes are. Yeah. Unfortunately, he died quite recently, but Guy Ritchie, um, not Guy Ritchie, the guy who created C. The guy who created C. Dennis Ritchie. Dennis Ritchie. I Dennis Ritchie. I She's a film director. She's Yes. <laughs> but he, it's an inspiration because he's done this, but he's not that well known. And whereas Steve Jobs, Guy from Apple, really well known. But all of his programming basically everything's going on the scene. Yeah. So you get some people who are great personalities and they can, they can talk the talk and all this kind of stuff, but then you have the less well known heroes. I think there's a drama coming out soon, there's one on ITV about the, the ladies of Metro Park, the, the unsung heroes. Yeah? So, somebody else, a hero, a computing hero? So, somebody that you think's made a big impact on? Uh, Joe Spolsky, more recently. Uh, Sorry, say it again. Joe Spolsky. Joe Spolsky. Joe Spolsky. Okay. He's the Guardian Folk Group, uh, Sack Over the website. Okay. And can we have one more, maybe? Eric, Eric Raymond, who uh, sort of tends to write at that the computer scene, and you know, the whole open source, the people on Bazaar type of thing. Isn't it great that nobody's mentioned the American guy who died recently? I forgot his name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so did somebody shout his name out? Richard Stallman. Oh. <laughs> what an impact he made. So he made on oh, my scene. What? No, he's not dead. No, but he made a comment about somebody else who died, didn't he? Some American guy that's very well known. Linus Torvalds. Yeah. Well, I've got some computing heroes as well. There's one of them. Let me know who that is. He's a professor. Works at the University of Manchester. He, he might have been involved a little bit in this BBC Micro thing. Steve Ferber. Steve Ferber. He's one of my heroes. I said when I was 11 years old, I came to England, there was this computer thing. Well, if he hadn't been involved in that, that, that would have looked the way it was. So, Steve Ferber, just down the road in Manchester. Isn't that like incredible? The guy who worked on the, the, the arm, risked us, you know, involved in all that project. You know, if you've got one of these things in your pocket, he, he worked, the some of the work he did contributed to the process and that, you know, this arm thing. Do you know what he's doing? He's helping me with a project. I think, so we're going to get a photo of that. We're doing a toy hacking project with the Raspberry Pi at the university. So I've got, so I've brought in my toy. I've got, well, two toys of mine, my Raspberry Pi and my robotic dog. And there's a guy called Andrew Robinson that's developed this interface called a Pi Face. It sits on top of the Raspberry Pi like that. And it, it buffers, so you can connect motors and servos and lights and switches without burning your Raspberry Pi. So, so it saves you 25 pounds every time you dabble about. That's great. I couldn't get into it. And Steve Ferber had a hacksaw, and he helped me get into that. I thought, wow, look, that's why I've got such a big smile on my face. But I've got lots of heroes. I'm just going to show you another hero in a moment. Here's one of my other heroes. I'll tell you who he is in a moment. You might already know, so I'll come back to that. Now, okay, so I want to explain this thing. So we talked about Hacks of the Future. Hacks of the Future has changed its name now. It's called Raspberry Chat. Okay? Have you got a microphone at the front? Ben, can you tell us what a Raspberry Jam is? Uh, raspberry Jam is a session or group or meeting where everybody gets together with their buyers they just have it, talk about it, demonstrate their ideas, show them what they're doing, try and find out what they can do, and just, just do pie. And I asked, I picked Ben because Ben is famous because Ben held the very, very first Raspberry Jam ever in Manchester on the Sunday in May. I was in Whitby for that week. Um, right. Jam. If you ever play music, like bass, guitar, or you know what a jam is. I, I play saxophone terribly, 
So I go along to a group, because they're all really good musicians, and no matter how badly I play my saxophone, it sounds like we're all making good music together. And four types of people come to a raspberry jam. Is anybody here who has a raspberry pie and knows what to do with it? Put your hand up. Okay, so you're one of the, you're one of the groups that comes along. We also have another group. Oh, sorry. We have another group that comes along. People who haven't got a raspberry pie, they really want one, they know what to do with it, but they haven't got one. Put your hand up. Okay, we've got some people. So you're in group two. We have another group of people that come to raspberry pie. People who have got a raspberry pie, they haven't got a clue what to do with it. Anybody here? Okay, thank you. And Ben himself, they haven't got a clue what to do with it. And then we have a fourth group of people. They haven't got a raspberry pie, they don't know what to do with it, and they don't really know what it's all about, but they're... They're in the wrong meeting. <laughs> they're a good target audience. Anybody here in that fourth group? Yeah? Great. So come to Raspberry Jam. So these Raspberry Jams, it's exact, it's it's on camp. It's bar camp. It's all these things. But everybody comes along. So oh, so you know which group you're in that. And we have one in Preston. So we've got about 50, 60 people there. This guy. Because I, I I can't help the likes of Jonathan look what they want to know. So I go around and I find people at times. This guy's called Simon Monk, he's an author. He writes books about our windows and interfacing Raspberry Pi. So he comes along and he does a talk at a Raspberry Town in Preston. And, and, but as well as talks, people just bring stuff and say, hey, look what I've got in my bag. And they open their bag out and they take all the stuff out and people go, whoa, how did you do that? And you just have conversations and they talk to each other. And we have all sorts of people there. Yes, we have women. Yes, we have kids. Yes, we have grandparents because, oh, and then we, we, such a, we spread the jam then. So you've seen something, you've heard something, right, go around and spread the jam. So it, some people would just say you basically break out, but we spread jam. And, oh, and there's jam, spreading jam. You might have met jam when you came to sign in this morning. We had, we had a rest of jam in Cambridge. Gosh, nearly 300 people came to that. It was amazing. You know, we, we filled a room, and I don't know if, you, if you're any good at spotting uh, celebrities, but if you kind of follow my finger up a little bit, there's a guy with less hair than I have, and the lady next to him laughing. Can we recognise who they are? Evan Upton and Liz Upton. They came along. In fact, we brought quite a lot of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. There's Leon and there's Keith and there's all sorts of people brought stuff along to talk. Some people came from London too. They've developed um, like a, a drone that can monitor endangered animals using a Raspberry Pi because when we were doing it before with MacBook Airs, every time an elephant walked on it, it got expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so put a £25 Raspberry Pi in there and it, it, it doesn't get quite as costly. We had a panel discussion, so there's Evan and Liz and does ask all sorts of questions like why can I not buy a Raspberry Pi? And he said, oh, by the way, did I mention I brought 300 with me to sell? Um, okay. We even had reporters coming along. We were Catherine Jones, yay! And, you know, so, my hero. This is my hero. Let me put you the lights down. Okay, this is Robert. Robert's 15 years old. I've never met him in real life. And he, and he sent me a message on Twitter one day. How old do you have to be to have a Raspberry Jam? Ah, how old are you? I'm 15. That's how old you have to be. <laughs> but if you told me you were 14, <laughs> if you told me you were 14, I'd give you the same answer. If you told me you were four, I'd have said, well, maybe we need to get some parents and see if there's people to help you. So Robert took it upon him. He lived in a place in Wales called... Bacumpa. <laughs> I think that's how you say it. And, and he held a raspberry jam, and people came from all over the country to this place in Wales. I couldn't go, I didn't have my car that week, but it was maybe good for me to stay away, so people didn't have to listen to my voice. And he, he's, he's come up with this sort of, um, I don't know what he calls it now, he has a name for it, but it's, it's basically, it's like an eco pie, it uses solar panels, it tops a battery up, you can take it wherever you want, and um, yeah, can I, I just want to show you a little video. The video clip from his raspberry because somebody made a video about the Mathumpus raspberry jam and it's 12 minutes long, I'll just play a little bit of it. Uh, okay, well, 
you know what, maybe I should save a few to watch later on. <laughs> because what happens is, you see, it, it's quite nice. There is an event, ooh, it snowed quite a lot, and then it went dark at one point, <laughs> when, when they lost the power, and... I just had the word began because I heard about one that was happening in Cambridge and thought that was a long way away from here and not as long as to get to one like that. So I thought I'll oh, so. run by it. after watching later on. But what's been brilliant is it starts with Act of Future now to inspire people all around the world. In fact, if I go back to my presentation, um, which, I, uh, which I made using the uh, open office, but then I had to import it into PowerPoint. Yeah, honestly. Oh, that's okay, I thought that was my laptop. So, this is Melbourne Raspberry Jam. Somebody in Melbourne said, can we have one in Australia? Are we allowed? Yeah, go for it. Try and get lots of kids to come. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe next time. Okay. Um, this is Singapore Raspberry Jam. Okay. They've got uh, loads of stuff happening there in Singapore. They managed to get Raspberry Pi before the people. I don't know how they're doing it. Um, and let's do something later on. So they're all over the world now. We've got 30 groups at the moment that are meeting regularly, and we've got sort of homemade Raspberry Jam where people just go out and make it. But we've got these big events, and I want more of these big events. So, um, right, so that's the future. I'll come on to that in a moment. So, one of the things I might do is I might go and interview the heroes. So, this is a guy who came up a uh, young rewired state. They won a prize. They came up with an app called Trumpies. Uh, go listen to the interview later on, find out why it's so great. So, young rewired state, something like Raspberry Jam, and like Hack the Future, but it's a, it's a week you spend coding. There's a bunch of us. We went down to Birmingham. Oh, there's some people missing off the end. Mm -hmm. And um, there's some girls, they came along. They, you can tell they feel a bit awkward. Girls, are you geeks? <laughs> no, we're not geeks, but we like doing geeky stuff. Okay, so they, they came along. Um, we, we were finalists, first year we entered. And we were finalists. Mm -hmm. So, the future. Ah, no, I hate a problem. So all this stuff I've been doing for free. I've been going around the country, putting fuel in my car, buying train tickets, parking. Now I got to the embarrassing situation, I've totally maxed out on my overdraft credit card and all the rest. And my wife started to say to me, Alan, did you spend an awful lot of time doing this raspberry jam and you're supposed to be put that cupboard door in the kitchen still not been on for three months? That paint's been waiting to be done. Alan, I'm afraid it's going to be me or the jam. So I'm getting to a point now where I find it difficult to carry on because it's expanding. It's great, I've got an army together, there's people here who I've met that are already organising about the jams, and it's great. If I spread this jam, it's going out. But I'm going to need some money soon, because I think what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to pay some people. It's great having volunteers, but I need to pay some people now to help spread this thing. I've got this plan where we're going to have every year 10 massive events, 300 to 500 people coming along. We've got venues lined up. We're using one on Monday, the Bristol Science Park, the Life Centre in Newcastle, the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. All these people want these things to happen. Imagine, yeah, I'm as excited as you are. You know? Imagine every year, 5,000 people, kids, families, teachers, they all come along and all, you know, woo, that's great. Oh, can I do that at home? Inspire me. So the likes of Jonathan, you know, in a few years' time, I won't have any more embarrassing parents even to a parent to say, not really getting a lot out of this ICT lessons. But I think it's time for me to shut up. Okay, thanks for listening. <laughs> so please, if, if you like what I'm saying, if you want to get if you want to join my army, if you want to be in my band, if you want to join a jam, get in touch with me and uh, let's let's spread this jam. Because it's all about inspiring everybody. It used to be just kids, but I want everybody. I want Parents, grandparents, some of the grandparents are saying, do I, should I, do I really fit in? Of course you do, you brought some kids with you. You know, as long as, you know, you can be responsible adults when you come along with the kids, that's great. Yeah. Okay, shut up, Alan.